verse is still our banner over the series, Romans 10, 13 through 15. Um, we talked about how we should, or why we should evangelize. We talked about how we should do it. Um, that's not always going to be the same for every person. Uh, we talked about it has to be done with love, with joy, and honesty, um, with urgency. Those are things. Um, so now we need to see what is next. So what happens after uh, you share the gospel? What's the next step um, in this process, if that's what you want to call it? Um, so when someone has uh, the gospel shared with them and they are an unbeliever, there is two choices that they face. Um, there's two things that come about. It's either a repentance and a belief in Christ, or it is a not a repentance or a belief in Christ, and it is continuing to live in their own way. Um, in this two-part uh, thing, I guess, there's no room for uh, I'm waiting or I'm undecided. Hmm. There's no room left for that. It's either yes or no. Um, it's you know, 50-50 there. It's not, you can't be uh, in the undecided or I'm waiting. Uh, we see this in Matthew 12, 30. Um, we'll just read it really quickly. Matthew 12, 30 says, Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So we see Jesus talking here. Um, he's saying that if you're not with me, you are against me. If you're undecided or you're waiting, you are still not with Christ. And, and that's um, against him. So there's those two options. We have to be clear on this. Um, actually, on our gospel track that we usually hand out here at Big Rights, uh, it says two ways to live. Um, there's kind of this, goes through the repentance and belief or, or not. Um, I encourage you, I set them out very specially on that table <laughs> back there. Um, I encourage you to take some as you leave. There's also some invite cards back there. Um, those, are, those are ways that we can share the gospel with others around us. Um, so they're back on the table back there. So we come to the conclusion that there is a submission to God, a repentance of sins, and a belief that Christ is Lord, or there's an ignorance to God, a rejection of faith, and a dependence upon self. So we come to grips with here. So if there is a negative response, which would be the latter of those two things, um, the best thing that we can do um, as the next step for us who are sharing the gospel is um, to be clear and to pray. This is very important. So if you have clearly communicated the gospel to someone and they're rejecting, um, there's no need to pester them further or push, push, push for a decision to be made. If you have clearly communicated the gospel, they have heard it um, and they have chose to not, to not uh, believe or repent um, there's no need to, to pester. But instead, we must pray for this person. We need to be clear and we need to pray. We need to pray that God softens their heart. Um, because we have to also remember that we are not the ones changing hearts here. That's not our business. That's not what we're doing. That's not what we're called to do. And we see that. Um, we have to remember that we are the foolish ones, right? First Corinthians. Uh, we brought that up, I think, the first week. First Corinthians 3. Oh no, sorry, wrong verse. But yes, that is in 1 Corinthians. But we, we see that we are the, the foolish ones that God uses to make his name known to others. Um, and we also see that um, in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 and 7, we see, it says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God gives the growth. We must remember that we are the messenger here. We are um, the person sharing the gospel, not person who has uh, created the gospel or can change the hearts of men. That's not us. So if, that, if there's a negative response, we must be clear. We must pray for this person um, as they uh, are ignorant to God and they reject the faith and they are still dependent on themselves. Um, but there's a positive response. This one's going to take a lot more time. It's going to be more time consuming. There's going to be a lot more effort put into this. There's a positive response. So, so I'm talking about someone who repents of their sin and confesses Christ as Lord. That's a positive response to the gospel. Um, what do we do now, then, is the question. What, what do we do after that? And I remember uh, one time I was in um, 
Haiti, and we were going hut to hut sharing the gospel with people. Um, and we kind of had what we were saying down packed, and we knew what to say. And we were, you know, just going through uh, just the gospel message with these people. And then someone, one of the members of the village in that area, came literally came out of the bushes and was asking, how can I be saved? Or who is Jesus? He was asking all these questions. I don't remember exactly what the question was, but he, he wanted there was salvation. Mm-hmm. He wanted to know who Jesus was. Um, and we all just, I just remember standing there like, we all kind of looked around like, what? <laughs> what do we say now? Like, no one like stepped up and was like, we, we just were talking to so many different people about it. But when someone, like it was shocking that someone would actually, you know, want to hear this message. <laughs> all right. So, um, but we, uh, we must come to the conclusion that when we encounter this, it's not just a, a high five and a praise God. And then you never see that person again, or you never follow up with this person, you never talk to them again. That's not how this works. Um, but you best believe that there is going to be praising and rejoicing in God. I mean, think about it. Someone in that moment, if the, if the, if the decision or the, the faith is genuine, it's genuine saving faith, and they really have a positive response to the gospel, in that moment, that person is now justified. And that is, is worthy of rejoicing and praising God. Believe me, that, that needs to happen. That is definitely there. But that's not all. Um, there are many examples from Scripture that show that it doesn't just stop there. It's not just a high five and praise God and then you're on your way. Um, it can't stop there. Um, you can see it first if we just go and re-examine... Um, the Great Commission, which we started this kind of series with, talking about. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we revisit that verse. It says, make disciples and baptize them. So discipleship is not an instantaneous um, act like justification is. You're justified. That's an instantaneous act. Discipleship is a process of I would regard it as even like a lifelong process. Making disciples is, is not just um, they're saved and then they're done, you know? The, the hope is that there's further growth and that there's uh, maturity that happens and that there's, you know, um, decisions made for Christ even further. So when someone starts to follow Christ, I think Pastor Raymond said this uh, a few weeks ago, he said that is just the beginning. That is just the beginning when someone starts following Christ. That is not the end to anything. The only thing that's the end of is the old self. That cuts it off right there. The new self starts, but that's a beginning, um, not an end. Uh, So we have to ask the question, where do we go from here then? Um, So I got a few things I see in Scripture, and uh, I see just, this is is what I see that Jesus has modeled for us even. Um, So we go from here, and we... First point, and these aren't in order of anything, but first thing I say is local church. Local church, local church. We must invite them to a gospel-centered, Bible-teaching local church. That's important. It's very important. Inviting them into a community of believers where they will grow is very important. Um, I'm taking math classes, and I had to write a, a uh, paragraph on advice I would give to a student to start seminary. And in that paragraph, I, I talked about community. It was very important. This is what I wrote. To the student who is about to enter seminary, please consider community. And my writing is not very good, so don't laugh at it. <laughs> community is massively important to your progress in your classes as well as your entire life. Like stated above, God designed us for community. He has designed us for relationships, so please do not abandon them. Being in a community of believers that genuinely cares for you and loves to see you grow in your faith is a great blessing from God. People that want to see you glorify God with your life are going to be the most helpful people to your schooling, to your ministry, and to your life. The place where I find this most helpful is the gospel-centered, Bible-preaching local church. If you are not a part of this church, you will not grow in seminary, you will not I use the word survive, but we talked about that. It's a good word to use. Uh, and I believe that in your Christian life, you will suffer from not being a part of the local church. Go to church, serve the church, and point people to the church.
Because if you are going to a church centered on the word of God, they will point you and others to Christ. And he is your ultimate need through seminary, and he's your ultimate need through your entire life. The importance of the community at the local church is huge in our lives. Um, I don't think it's too much to say that believers will suffer a growth, a, a maturation, uh, when they are not a part of the local church, when they try to uh, go through this Christian life um, on their own. I think there is a suffering there that will take place, uh, a stunting of growth. It's like drinking coffee when you're really young. I don't know if that's a myth or if that's true or not, but um, it's kind of like that, it's stunting your growth in the faith, in your walk. Um, Romans 12, real quickly, I'll read this. If we are called to live an individual Christian life, then there would be no call to be part of the body of Christ. So this is 12, verses 4 and 5. It says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many are, in one, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. And it goes on, it says, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Um, and it talks about all these different gifts. But anyway, there's these, and that's just one example, but there's many examples in Scripture talking about the body of Christ, the unity of believers. You can go through Acts and see the, the start of the church and how, how important it was and how God used, uses that and used it and has designed it for us. Um, it's, it's very important that when we share the gospel with someone that we then point them to a local church that is center on the gospel, center on the word of God. Um, and we can do that here at Baker Heights. We can invite them to Baker Heights because that, I believe, is true of us here. Um, so we can do that, but it doesn't have to be Baker Heights that we invite them to. Like, let's say you're on vacation and you, in, you encounter someone, you share the gospel, and they have this positive response. Go do some searching, find a local church that they can be a part of, or talk about the importance of it, or at least follow up with them about it. Um, Obviously, they're not going to be able to make it to Baker Heights or whatever it may be, but there's other churches in this area that are centered on the Word of God. It's important that they're a part of the body of Christ that goes beyond the walls here at Baker Heights. Uh, so the first thing is, is consider um, inviting them to the local church. Next thing, um, the next two things are going to be found at the local church. But the first thing is baptism. Walk a new believer through what it means to be baptized. And I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, baptism here, but um, I don't believe that being baptized saves you. Uh, I don't think that's right. Um, I think it is important in the life of the believer. It's, a, it's an obedience to Christ. It's a, it's a following Him. So, and I see that because I see Christ regarded as important because He was baptized. Um, Matthew three. Fourteen, fifteen it says John would have prevented him, saying, "I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me." But Jesus answered him, "Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness." And then he consented, and Jesus, and when he and when he was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God sitting like a dove coming to rest on him. And behold, there was a voice from heaven that said, "This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased." Jesus regarded baptism as important. He calls us to do this in the Great Commission. Therefore, it's a very important step in the life of a believer. Um, and we also see that in the, in the scriptures that baptism was, uh, was tied to the repentance of faith. Um, repentance and the faith of the believer. It says in Mark 1, 5, it says, In all the country of Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him, and were being baptized by him in the river. Jordan confessing their sins. There is a tie of baptism to repentance of sin and belief in God. And then the second thing, and um, this is the Lord's Supper, which we observe here as well. Um, it's another gospel ordinance that believers should observe. And uh, this is a popular verse that we actually turn to when, when we come together. The pastor will often read this. It's 1 Corinthians 11. 23 through 26, it says, For I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, 
which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That's a command. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Another command. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's the why. Um, so we see that these are very important things. Conclusion, what can we take away from this? No matter the response, as, no matter the response you get from this person you are evangelizing to or sharing the gospel with, you as the follower of Christ are not done in that moment. Um, it, it's not over. Uh, whether it's negative, you pray and you're clear about the gospel message. Whether it's positive, you consider uh, baptism, Lord's Supper, inviting them to a local church. These things are imperative. They, they, they are very important. Um, and besides that, all around just living life with this new believer. Um, there's, there's a call for that. We see that in Acts with the church, how they were just, just basically living with one another. They were always with each other, um, rejoicing and praising God. Um, so we cannot leave someone hanging after the gospel is shared. There is an inclusion into the life of the local church that I think needs to happen. Um, this is where they will examine gospel ordinance, ordinances like baptism and the Lord's Supper as well. Um, but, all that to say, and what's next, I might, I might be wrong on some of this stuff, or I might have missed some stuff. Um, discipleship is huge, but that's going to happen, I think, in the local church. Um, all this to say, there's no what's next unless we first share. There's no what's next unless we first share this message. So, again, I return to Romans 10. We'll end it with this. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news, preach the good news. We have to be this person. We're called by God to do this, to share the gospel. Um, so we must make it a part of our lives. So, so much easier said than done, but um, when we obey God in this way, it will always, 100% of the time, be worth it. Every single time, it will be worth it. Let's pray. Yeah. Father, again, we just thank you. Thank you for this church. Thank you that as a church we gather and we're centered on your word. I just pray that we would never lose sight of that. That we would never be characterized as a church that is fake. That we would be real and genuine um, before you. That we would have joy in our hearts and love in our hearts um, to go out from these walls and share the gospel with others around us, Lord, that we would see people saved and, and brought into this church and, and growing in their faith and maturing and, and serving and following your word and just, just having a love and a hunger for it. Lord, I hope that as we do this, that we will see the same in our own lives and that we would uh, continue to uh, mature and grow as well in our faith. That we, I see this is so important, Lord. Help us to share. Give us boldness. We need your help. We cannot do it on our own. We cannot do it on our own. You have sent us, so let us go, Lord. Let us go. So, in your son's name, let me pray. Amen. Amen.